My interest in safety began pretty ignobly. Uh, my father, at the young age of 50, died from a misdiagnosis. They thought he had lymphoma and he had leukemia, and by the time they realized it, he was too late for therapy. And I'll never forget him coming home uh, and me carrying his crumbling 80-pound body up to his hospice bed with him writhing in pain and being told by the hospice team that there was nothing they can do. I became convinced after that that patients deserve more than our health system often gave them. We don't really know how many patients die needlessly, but it's probably the third leading cause of death. When we started, we focused on one type of healthcare acquired infections, central line infections. They kill about 30,000 people a year, about as many people who die from breast or prostate cancer each year. Our rates at Johns Hopkins were astoundingly high. They were somewhere between 11 and 18 per thousand catheter days. And we weren't alone. That was what many of the hospitals across the country had. So when we went to go reduce these infections, we went to the Centers for Disease Control to get their guideline, but their guideline was over 150 pages and recommended 90 things. So we had the idea to call out from that guideline a simple five-item checklist. Just what was most important, five simple behaviors. Wash your hands, clean your skin with chlorhexidine, avoid placing the catheters in the groin, cover yourself and the patient, and ask every day if you still need these catheters. We then encourage the nurses to work with the doctors and ensure that the doctors comply with this checklist. That was a bit of a culture change. Indeed, I almost caused World War III. We had a revolt in our hand, but it was magical. We said our goal is to get to zero infections, and we've eliminated those infections here at Johns Hopkins, and we've now spread that state by state across the U.S. to 44 states. We've put this program now in all of England, in all of Spain, in Pakistan, in Peru, in United Arab Emirates, all with similar results. And it's the exact kind of thing that Johns Hopkins Medicine should be doing as part of our mission. You see, having been educated and trained at Johns Hopkins and now practicing medicine here, I'm convinced that the great breakthroughs in medicine in the next century will not come from within a discipline, but from the intersections of disciplines. And we need to create a forum where those intersections could occur. So we were very fortunate that Michael Armstrong, the chairman of the Johns Hopkins Medicine Trustees, made a generous gift to create the Armstrong Institute. That institute merges safety research and safety operations in a novel way that has never occurred before. And our goal is to eliminate preventable harm, to improve patient outcomes and experience, and to reduce healthcare costs. Much like our bloodstream project, we are now doing national projects on pneumonia, which also kills about 30,000 people in surgical safety. And we're doing a really innovative program that's been funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation to create an idealized ICU. Five million patients are in the ICU each year and 20% of Medicare patients die in an ICU. So many of us, if not nearly all of us, will at some time experience ICU care. And we need to make sure it's the safest possible. And importantly, these principles that we're doing in the ICU don't just stay there. They apply to the rest of the hospital and to outpatient medicine. And I believe deeply that one of the responsibilities of Johns Hopkins Medicine being the world's premier healthcare institutions and, and drawing from the university is to use our health system as the learning lab, to find out what works, what improves health. And when we find that out, to then scale and spread it across the country and across the world. Right? And that is the rich tradition that we need to live up to as being part of Johns Hopkins University.